Hi, welcome to Bernard's Essay Talk and the fourth of this four film series looking at the liberalism of Locke, Mill and John Rawls. In the last film I looked at Mill, what he brought to the liberal table, what was radical in his thinking, what was conservative and how he fitted into the wider liberal philosophy. In this film I'm going to do something similar but not exactly with John Rawls who, like Locke, was an innovator, bringing something new to liberalism. And also, like Mill, he took existing liberalism and made it better. But unlike Locke and Mill, there's no tension in Rawls's thought between a radical or a conservative instinct, because Rawls had no conservative instinct, and his liberalism was consistently radical. And one of the reasons why Rawls was a radical was because of his upbringing. And he's really a good example of someone whose thinking uh, is shaped by his time and his own experiences. He was born in 1921, and from a very early age, he had a strong sense of the unfairness or even the cruelty of life. As a child, two of his brothers died from an illness that he unwittingly transmitted. And as a boy, he witnessed the poverty of America's Great Depression, and as a man, he witnessed the horror of the Second World War, and in particular, the aftermath of the atom bomb on Hiroshima, which he saw um, firsthand, the consequences. And these experiences really shaped his thinking. Now, in terms of what he brings to liberalism, in terms of his distinct contribution to liberalism, well, firstly, he provides a very unique and distinctly liberal form of radicalism. And the second thing that's distinct about him, which is really just a, a continuation of the first, is that he brings the idea of justice into liberal thinking in a way that no previous liberal had ever done. And this is all set out in his master work, A Theory of Justice, published in 1971, which sets out three things, really. What uh, Rawls considered to be unjust, how we can find uh, principles of what justice is, and then finally a definition of what justice finally is. And not surprisingly, either way I'll look at liberalism is to organise these into four parts. Uh, the first, looking at what Rawls tells us is unjust in society. The second, telling us how we might find the principles of justice. The third, what his final definition of justice actually is. And then finally, I'll look at his place within the wider philosophy of liberalism. All right then, so getting on to section one. In terms of what Rawls thought was unjust in our society, he thought that the biggest injustice in our society is what he would call arbitrary privilege. Now, liberals have been long opposed to the abuse of arbitrary power, but Rawls is going to extend this, extend this idea of arbitrary power to the idea of arbitrary privilege. Now, the dictionary definition of privilege states that it is something based on random choice or a personal whim rather than any kind of clear reason or system. And it's easy to see why liberals were opposed to the idea of arbitrary power. But for rules, arbitrary privilege works in a similar kind of way. And the way arbitrary privilege works is when a person is privileged but has made no contribution to that privileged, where power and status are based on factors for which people can claim no credit. And for rules, the allocation of power and status and income and wealth is mostly based on arbitrary privilege. Now, this idea of arbitrary privilege is not in itself unique. What is unique to Rawls is the kind of things that he would include under its banner. So he begins, perhaps not surprisingly, with the kind of privileges that we would associate with the accident of birth. So those privileges that people have when they're born into wealthy families, with loving parents, in good neighbourhoods, with good schools. And we can get the idea of this with a very simple metaphor of a race. You could call it, if you like, the race of life. And here, if you let everybody run the race, but some start further down the track, 
then the race will not be fair and you can see how privileges will place the privileged further down that track. But Rawls goes beyond this, um, arguing that even if we all started at the same point, the runner who is blessed by nature to athletic prowess also has, in Rawls' view, arbitrary privilege, arguing that the gifted, and it's worth thinking about that word, gifted, something given to you, not that you create yourself, the gifted get rewards that they don't deserve simply because they're gifted. And he goes on to argue that even people who are hardworking with a capacity for striving, even that, even that capacity to strive, in some senses depends on family circumstances for which they can claim no credit. And what Rawls says about these natural gifts, if you like, or these gifts of luck, he says it still permits the distribution of wealth and income to be determined by the natural distribution of abilities and talents. So what Rawls is saying, and it's very radical, is that virtually all the inequalities of power, status, income and wealth in our society are arbitrary and therefore unjust. So turning now to section two, having identified injustice, Rawls now looks for a method to find what are the principles of justice. And of course, this is all set out in his masterwork, A Theory of Justice, in 1971. And this, of course, is his big contribution to liberal thought. It's a new, radical and distinctly liberal theory of justice. And he says the first problem to be overcome in any kind of theory of justice is the way that self-interest prevents us from thinking objectively about justice. Because those who benefit from current injustice are simply unable to think objectively. Those of us that are privileged are blinded by our own self-interest. And the solution that Rawls offers to this is very original. To overcome this, he says, we need to be stripped completely of our sense of position in existing society. We need to be able to stand completely outside of the social order and our place within that order. And to do this, he devises an imaginary thought experiment based on what he's going to call the veil of ignorance. And this veil of ignorance is the idea that individuals will have no knowledge of the things that give them status. They'll have no knowledge of their race, of their age, of their gender, of their class, of their sexual orientation, of their IQ, even of their conception of what a good society is. And in that position of ignorance, then they will be asked to organise the best and most just kind of society. Now, it's important to say that this veil of ignorance is really only a partial ignorance uh, because the only thing that we are admittedly completely and totally ignorant of is our position or more precisely what our future position will be in the society that we create. But we will be aware of three things in particular. There'll be three things that we have complete knowledge of. The first is the, the existing inequalities of any society which undermine justice. So, for instance, we will be aware that to be born black in America will massively increase our chances of deprivation. The second thing that we'll be aware of is the things that are necessary for a just and therefore a flourishing society. So the role of schools and hospitals, these kinds of things, the things that make for a flourishing and a just society. And the third thing that we'll be aware of is the various kinds of political arrangements which exist to achieve these things. So we'll be aware of the relative merits of, say, capitalism or socialism in any approach to organising society. And it's with all of that, with the awareness of what needs to be done, but the complete ignorance of what our position will be from the veil of ignorance that we will produce, Rawls argues, the fairest society. And we will do this on the basis of reason and 
self-interest. So we're not looking to produce a fair society. We will produce it because our self-interest and our reason will make us objectively arrive at a just society. And the reason for this is simple. Because if we really know what it's like to be disadvantaged in existing society, we wouldn't want to take the risk of ending up in one of those disadvantaged groups. And he's basically arguing that any sane person would not want to take the risk of entering into our existing setup because it has so many obvious discriminated and dominated classes. To be safe, we would want to ensure that if we fell into the lowest position because we don't know where we're going to end up, we would want it to be something we could live with. The metaphor that's given here is one of a pizza party. Imagine you're having a pizza party and you are asked to cut the pizza. You can do it any way you like, but you don't know which piece you're going to receive. You might cut it into smaller or larger pieces. But one thing is for sure, you would cut the pizza in such a way that if you got the smallest piece, it is still something that you could live with. And it's from this experiment, this thought experiment, that we can discover the principles of justice. And Rawls argues there are just two, two essential principles of justice, which everybody in that situation, operating on the basis of objectivity, reason and self-interest would come up with. And these are the liberty principle and what he calls the difference principle. Now, the liberty principle is really straightforward. This basically states that every person who understood things like slavery or apartheid or the Holocaust uh, would want to be free, would want respect and dignity, would not want to be an oppressed minority and would want the most extensive possible freedom that you can have. And of course, the most extensive possible freedom that we can have was theorised by Rawls's predecessor, John Stuart Mill, which included the freedom of speech, the freedom of conscience, the freedom of thought, the freedom of taste and the freedom of assembly, those kinds of freedoms. And of course, this makes Rawls very much in the liberal camp. So that's the liberty principle. But it's the difference principle, uh, the second of the two principles, which is the most interesting. Because Rawls argues that if every person were aware of all the different kinds of arrangements that we had to achieve the best possible society, and in particular, if they were aware of the ways in which societies have been organised around either equality or inequality, they would choose whichever system worked best for the least well-off. And Rawls argues that the most rational choice would be to accept inequalities, but only those that work to the benefit of the least well-off. Of course, if it can be shown that socialist equality can do this better, then that would be chosen. But if socialism can't, if it can be shown that inequality and unequal society actually benefits the least well-off more than socialist inequality, then that would be chosen. And this leads us to uh, the third section, which is how Rawls ends up defining justice. So these principles, the principles of liberty and what he calls the difference principle, together make up justice. So it's not an eye for an eye. It's not we all get the same. It's not we get our just desserts. It's justice as fairness. We choose what is fair. We choose that were we to end up in the situation which was the lowest, that would still be okay. And it's the kind of fairness that our own self-interest and our own reason would insist upon if we were to design a society and didn't know where we would find ourselves in that society. And this is Rawls's unique contribution to political philosophy and to liberalism, a kind of form of egalitarian inequality, if you like where there's no socialist levelling down and the gifted are encouraged to exercise their talents, but only in a system that benefits the least worst off.
arguing that those who have been favoured by nature may gain from their good fortune only on terms that improve the situation of those who have lost out. So that's Rawls's theory. Now let's conclude with Rawls's place in liberalism. And again, the place that he has is to bring to liberalism this distinct conception of liberal justice. I mean, justice has been the subject of political philosophy ever since Plato. In fact, Plato's Republic is really about the search for justice. But unlike their ideological opponents, for 300 years, liberalism had little to say about justice. It talked a lot about freedom, of course, and it was really socialists who did all the talking about justice, arguing that justice was social justice, which was best achieved through equality. While in many ways conservatives directly oppose this, arguing the opposite, arguing that justice is just deserts, the unequal reward for unequal ability in a hierarchical society. So you have on one side justice equated to equality and, and on the other justice equated to inequality or hierarchy. And what Rawls is going to do in some senses is to take the best from both. And in terms of his place in liberalism, Rawls' great intervention is to bring justice into liberal thought. And as simple as it seems, this was considered one of the most significant innovations in 20th century philosophy, which addresses the weaknesses in both the socialist and conservative theories of justice. And crucially, it's a uniquely liberal concept of justice. And it's not just a theory destined to remain in the clouds, but a simple way to show people how their societies are unfair and which allows us to think objectively about what a fair society would look like. And in terms of liberalism, by stripping away the elitism of liberalism, it allowed it, perhaps for the first time in its long history, to finally embrace the lowest positioned and most vulnerable in our society.